Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. So our topic today is going to be training and explaining long short-term memory models. Um, it's a very cool topic. This won't stay. Hold on. Um, one second. Let's see if I can get this to stay. Um, so it's a topic I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I'm excited about it for a number of reasons. Um, primarily because these types of models do a very effective job of teasing insights and finding patterns out of unstructured data. Uh, there's a lot of cool products that are coming to market. Oh, thank you. Sorry, it's going to be a challenge for me. You have to remind me. Uh, is that better? Okay. So um, there's a lot of cool products that are coming to market um, that leverage these methods. Um, so what we're going to cover today are really three big themes. Um, number one, why explainability? Why is it relevant? Why is it important? We will look at explainability through the lens of a user. What goes in, what goes out, what are some cool products that are using these types of methods? Um, there's a cohort of users that really value explainability. So we'll touch on that. Um, two, training, training long short-term models. Um, here, the, really the main goal is, is to build an intuition of what is going on inside of these models with an eye on, if we're going to explain it, what are some of the key pieces of these models we need to have an intuition about? Um, Three, we'll shift gears into explainability. The bulk of that is going to be around a very, very cool. Sorry to keep interrupting. No. Is that better? Um, the bulk of the third part is going to be around um, a very cool tool called LSTM Biz, which is out of uh, Harvard's NLL NLLP lab. And it should. So, all right, I'm not going to move. Um, so, uh, LSTM Viz is a very cool tool. Uh, these are very complicated models, and it does, I think, a very neat job of visualizing what's going on. Um, before we go on, just a quick show of hands. Who here is familiar with or has trained a recurrent neural network? Okay. Uh, same question, but for long short-term memory models. Familiar with or trained? Okay, so roughly a third. So for you third, you may be a little bit bored for parts of this. For the other two thirds, you might feel I'm going a little too quickly. Um, there's a lot to this. Uh, there's a lot of de details I'm just going to brush over. Um, what I'm trying to focus on is the intuition. And I think that's the important part to get to the explainability. Uh, a little bit about myself. Think of me as one part management consultant, one part data scientist, one part technologist. Uh, I guest lecture at Columbia on topics similar to these. Okay, um, maybe if we turn this microphone off. So, uh, if you want to reach out to me, Bill C. Gold across all of these platforms. Um, and sometime tomorrow, I'll post this presentation and some of the code up onto GitHub. Sorry, folks on that side of the room, but we think maybe bring it over here. Okay. I'm not moving. How's that? Is that good, everybody? So, uh, it's a big week for me for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm very excited about the speech, uh, this presentation. Number two, um, I'm going back for my master's. That started Monday at Georgia Tech. So, this is Nemo on his first day of school. Uh, and number three, 
for the first time ever, I'm presenting to an audience where my son is here. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, another back to school reference. Anyone know what this movie is? Yep. Back to school. Back to school, excellent. <laughs> Do you know the name of the dive? Oh, yes, the lucky Lindy. Close, yeah, the triple Lindy. The triple Lindy. Okay. Uh, why explainability? Um, this, okay. Um, there's a lot of relevance to explainability, I think. Um, but first, um, why should we use LSTMs? Uh, they are very, very effective at um, predicting the next item in a sequence. Um, and I'd ask you to think about sequences very broadly. They can be um, continuous data and stock prices. You can think of it as pixels. Uh, in a picture, there's a sequence of pixels. What's the next pixel that's going to appear? You could think of it as audio signals. You can think of um, language as very much a, a sequential piece of data. Um, and, and that's going to be a big part of what we're going to be focusing on here. What are LSTM models used for? Uh, they, you see them day to day as part of auto responses and email and text messaging. Um, many people are using LSTM models for documents, for creating new documents, for summarizing existing documents. Um, and you may also see those in customer service automation with various chatbots. So they're becoming more and more prevalent. So here in this demo, um, the input is cursive handwriting. Uh, the model is outputting the characters that are written um, up on top. And this is all based on an LSTM model. So this is, I think, a good example of pixel data. Sure. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to keep interrupting him, but for everyone's good, I think. Right, we can't turn that down on the amplifier, so I'm trying to turn it down on the mic. Is this so the audience can hear me, or it yeah, can be recorded? It's for the, for the audience. Can you guys hear me without the microphone? How about the people in the back? Is there anyone who can hear me? All right, screw the Trick question. Yeah, let's ditch that. OK, um, using Gmail, right? There's all sorts of very, very cool auto suggestions that Gmail will present to you in shade, uh, shaded gray. Um, they call that Smart Compose. Um, well, they don't use LSTMs. They use a variety of models that are cousins of LSTMs to do that. So inside of that, uh, what Google has done is they've experimented with many, many different types of methods. And the two that bubbled up to the top, number one, seek to seek. And number two, a combination of neural bag of words uh, and recurrent language models. Um, while the seek to seek had slightly better performance and slightly better accuracy, there's a significantly more expensive cost to executing that. So ultimately, this team chose to go with the latter. Remember, we're still in the, looking at this from the user mode. Um, another area that's gaining lots of traction um, with, with uh, long short-term memory models um, is in document processing. In this particular area, it's in the legal domain. So imagine that someone is in a store and they slip and fall, or they chip a tooth on, on some food. Um, the legal process is to file a complaint, and then the store will respond with a request for production, which is really a request for information. Um, they're generating these requests for productions now based on long short-term memory models. Um, it, it's, it's pretty fascinating, I think. Um, with all the cool stuff, what's going on inside? It really has this massive black box quality to it. So, um, and for many, that's okay. And for often, with lots of these deep learning models, they're making suggestions that a human is choosing to accept or to override. Your uh, auto prompts on text messages. You know, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. Um, Self-driving -car, car features. 
Um, they're making suggestions and decisions, but you as the driver can override those many times. Um, but these are really complicated models. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but just to articulate the point that there's millions of activations that are going on inside of these networks. So stepping a little bit away from long short-term me memory models, um, this is an example of ResNet. And with ResNet, um, this has millions and millions of activations inside. So these are all different layers. And some of these models have up to 152 layers. And any one of these boxes might be a 256 by 256 convolution. So if you imagine the linear algebra that's going on here and the calculus of going backwards and forwards and propagations, it's absolutely massive. So while the results are really astounding, and as of four years ago, the error rate was 3%, now that's below 1%, um, there is this big, I want to emphasize that there's this big black box quality to these. So why explainability? Uh, and what do we need? We, we need to focus a little bit on the architecture, the, the massive quantity of activations, um, and the fact that many of these are using unstructured data makes this a more complicated factor. So I want to shift gears a little bit and, and shift to a real world example for a real world model I've trained. Um, so SIFI, who knows what SIFI stands for in the banking context? Systemically important financial institution. These big banks um, have to stress test their portfolios and those results have to be defended internally to uh, model governance teams and they have to be defended externally to the federal government and the, the um, office of the controller of the currency and the treasury department. So. One model I trained contained five variables. For that one model, I generated 500 pages of documentation. It, it was just everything. It was, it was the full lineage of the data. It was the quality checks and profiling of the data. It was uh, the, the universe of variables considered, why they were chosen, why they were rejected the various methods we used, the regularization. Um, it was a massive undertaking. It was, in my best guess, 25,000 team hours over the course of nine months. And this was just one of 15 products that the bank brought to market. So in this credit risk role, um, not only do they value explainability, but they're compelled by federal laws to have explainability. Um, so really what kind of excites me about this topic is there are many stakeholders that can benefit from these methods but choose not to use them and choose not to use them for really compelling reasons that they have to explain or they feel the explainability is an important part of their, their business model. So some of these uh, cohorts are credit risk in the context of stress testing, whether it's CCAR, Basel, um, fair re credit reporting. Legal community. Um, lawyers are traditionally the laggards in accepting uh, and, and ramping up on new technologies. Um, they're thinking about is it accurate? Their whole case can hinge on one word selection. Um, they are very much focused on what biases exist. Um, it's, it's unusual for me to think of legal as a data rich field, but with these tools it really is. Um, but in order for there to be broad acceptance of these methods within the legal community, explainability has to be a big part of the solution. Um, and medical diagnostics. So if, if um, there's convolutional neural networks that can detect tumors more accurately than doctors, but to use things like that requires all sorts of FDA approval. Okay. So that's the chapter on um, why uh, explainability is compelling. Let's shift gears and start talking about training. However, before we do that, um, I often spend a little more time on trying to put out um, funny titles than I should be. 
So would anyone here care to guess what my inspiration for training and explaining would be? You can't guess, Dana. Any basketball fans? Knicks fans? Hmm, maybe not. Pardon? Clyde Frazier, you got it, exactly. So he's the face of announcing the New York Knicks. He's a point guard, all-star, very, and he, he talks in rhymes, posting and toasting, dishing and swishing. Probably had the game on while I was thinking about this and came up with training and explaining. All right, so in this training section, our goals are really to gain an intuitive understanding of what's going on inside of long short-term memory models. To do that, we're gonna talk about the architectures. Um, we'll touch briefly on the mathematics of this, um, and then we'll go through some R code um, that leverages Keras and TensorFlow to train a fairly simplistic model. Um, and what we'll also do is we'll take a bit of a step back and first delve into recurrent neural networks, which are um, long-term, long short-term memory models are an extension of. So what is a recurrent neural network? Um, it is a model that's very effective at sequencing. Um, it is essentially taking an input. Um, it is taken, Deep learning networks have all sorts of hidden states inside of them. But what it does that's fairly unique is it pulls its hidden state from the previous point in time. So it has this sh quality of shifting time. Um, there's a terrific blog post by Andre Kaparthi on the unreasonable effectiveness of RNNs. Um, the link is in here. I'd encourage you all to look at it if this is a topic of interest. Um, we're going to touch on some of the key gaps of them, and then we'll go through a few examples. So in an RNN, think of three different layers, um, input layer, output layer, and this hidden layer in between. Um, what I'd like you to take away from this, do that one also do this, uh, the input layer is feeding up into the hidden layer in the same time sequence. So the time goes this way on, along the x-axis. Um, but then the hidden layers shift in time with these to go to the next output layer. And that's where you get some of the sequencing qualities of this. Um, and there's a time shift involved, um, which was what makes this architecture particularly well suited for sequencing. For Rick and Morty fans, um, they're often referencing time travel. Um, does anyone know what movie Rick and Morty is based on? Back to the future, exactly. Um, okay. There's lots of different architectures involved with RNN. Uh, I just want to give you a flavor of that. There's one to, one to ones, there's many to many's, and there's all sorts of architectures in between. And, and to build on the intuition of this, let's imagine that the sequence that we want to predict for is really a sequence of characters, okay? So we're gonna start build, uh, building out the word hello. Each character gets encoded as a numeric, a unique numeric, um, and then on the output layer, we're getting the probability that the next of what the next character was gonna be. Take the, the highest probability and call that our output. In between, we have our hidden layers, and, and, and the training process is gonna jigger these around, do a bunch of calculus, but ultimately figure out the best hidden layer that will encode your inputs to the outputs. Ultimately, this all distills down to Y equals XW plus B, where W and B are your weights and bias in this middle layer right here. This is the blog post where a lot of this is referenced. I'd encourage you all to take a look at that. All right, there are two key gaps I wanna talk about with the recurrent neural network. Um, one is the exploding gradient, the other is the vanishing gradient. Um, RNNs have a big bias towards recency. Um, they're constantly looking at one 
hidden layer in, in one time step backwards. Um, as a result, that close and recent information carries a big heavy bias. Um, on the exploding side, as you're doing all this calculation of forward and backward propagation, little numbers can explode and become big. Fortunately, this is easily fixed, and this is fixed by clipping the gradient. It's basically taking a, shaving a percentage off. The harder one to solve is the vanishing gradient. Um, and here, I'd like to give you a little intuition of what that means. So imagine this sentence. I grew up near Queens, great childhood memories, sports, friends, family, dog. My favorite baseball team is? Mets. Oh, good guess. That is awesome. The answer is the Mets. But what are the two key pieces of information <laughs> to get to that sequence? Baseball and Queens. and Queens. Baseball and Queens, right? So if it's an RNN, the RNN will do a very good job with baseball. It's close. Where the RNN is going to struggle is with the Queens. It's pretty distant and pretty far back. That was a great guy. I wish I had prizes. Good guess. So this is an architecture mathematical view of the vanishing gradient. You can see the time sequence along the x-axis, and you can see within our hidden layers as it, the shading gets lighter and lighter, it really, over many steps, it, it just vanishes. Um, and really, the key thing to take away from this is that the sensitivity to that decay is exponential. And it's exponential because of all the calculus baked inside of these models. OK. So let's shift gears out of RNNs and start focusing on long short-term memory models. The genesis of this is in 1997, I believe, um, with this paper. So the kind of cool thing about a lot of these methods is they're not particularly new. Um, they've been around for a long time. Convolutional neural networks are from, I think, the 60s. Um, so the key thing to take out of this, and we'll, do, we'll, we'll unpack what this is doing, but they're much more um, effective with the long-term interactions. How do they do that? So. The diagram for the LSTM looks at a high level very similar to the RNN. It's got our sequence going along here. We've got hidden states. We've got um, the previous state feeding in, into the next state. Where things start to get really, really interesting is what's going on in each one of those cells. Okay? And there's a lot to unpack here. But conceptually, the way to think about each and every one of those cells is it's a network into itself. You guys remember this movie? Inception, right? So it's, it has a quality of being a network within a network. And Inception is about dreams within dreams. So unpacking the LSTM, there's a few concepts I'd like to articulate. Um, one is the cell state, and that's what we're learning and learning to remember. Um, one of those gates inside of the individual node is called a forget gate, and the job of that gate is, is to say, what information should we keep away from the cell state? And, and more quickly, I'm trying to define it without using the word forget, <laughs> um, but, but is not important and should be set aside. Um, there's inputs and there's outputs. And, and the key thing here is each and every one of these has its own set of weights, has its own gating criteria, so that as the model trains, each one of these can, can train to the task it has, it's responsible for. Okay, one by one. So the cell state. What, let me go to this side, so splitting it evenly. Um, what I'd like you to think about is this vertical line here. Um, it's running through the top. It's the cell state. So this is C T minus one is the previous cell state. C of T is the next cell state. Um, think of it like a conveyor belt. Information is passing through it. 
and as the information passes through this, um, we're tinkering with it. And we're tinkering with it based on what the forget gate is, is, is thinking the answer should be and, and what the input and the predicted cell state should be. So they're all influencing this conveyor belt. Um, some of the interactions are minor. Sometimes there's no changes at all. But um, there's a constant flow of information going through here. What are the gates doing? The gates here, um, ultimately they're adding information into this conveyor belt. Um, they are often driven by sigmoids, so a one or a zero. Um, the one is telling us to completely retain the information that's flowing through. The zero is to say completely set aside whatever the information is flowing through. There's not many good Bill Gates memes out there, so I apologize for this one. It's about the loan taking, the bank taking out a loan from Bill Gates is the essence of it. All right, let's talk about the forget gates. Um, the forget gate is inputting, taking our input, the X sub T, uh, it's taking the previous hidden state um, and it's combining those through a sigmoid. And you can, it's ultimate, its decision is what information do we throw away? Um, and the mathematics of it is, are dot products uh, between the weights, which we're gonna determine through training, um, the previous hidden state and the input plus whatever bias. And I apologize that I'm going through this quickly, but really what I'd like you to take away from this is the intuition. Um, inputs and candidate cell states. Similar idea with the inputs. It's going through a sigmoid. Um, its inputs are the previous hidden state uh, and its own set of weights. Um, the candidate cell state is kind of interesting, whereas the sigmoid goes from zero to one, fully keep, fully throw away. What's the job of the 10H? between negative one and one. So it's taking our, our zero to one distribution and forcing that to a minus one to a one. So our negative values have a meaning to the model other than throwing away. Um, so with the candidate, again, it has its own set of weights. It takes the previous hidden state, um, its inputs, and it's going to spread that out over minus one to one. So just to give a linguistic intuition of what might be going on here, and this is just a made up example, but perhaps gender is part of the sentence. Um, and then there's a new subject that might appear that the cell state is trying to find signals for. Um, and perhaps it's trying to replace um, the new subject with the old one that we're forgetting. And I'm just making this up, but I'm trying to connect it back to the linguistics of what might be going on here. I was a little nervous about putting this one up there. I might be dating myself. Okay, uh, the cell state. So um, the cell state's purpose uh, is to really um, be a gate uh, and to do all sorts of linear algebra. It's gonna do our multiplication of the forget gate um, and it's going to uh, take the inputs and, and dot product that with the candidate for the cell state. Okay, and you can see those will all make its way back into the conveyor belt of, of the cell state. Um, and lastly, for each state, we're gonna have an output. You know, in, in the earlier example, in the word hello, we were predicting the next character. So somehow that needs to be output, um, and that's the function of the output gate. Uh, it too has a sigmoid, it too has its own sets of weights, um, and biases, and that gets pushed through a 10H and makes it its way back up into the cell states. So again, a made up example of uh, linguistic intuition for the cell states. Um, maybe it just saw a subject, and now with the subject, maybe there's a verb it wants to attach up to that. Um, and, and that verb might talk to some of the conjugations about so whether it's singular or plural or things of that nature. 
Um, the last, anyone ever have a crepe cake from Lady M? Best dessert ever, in my opinion. Anyway, I want to talk about layers um, because uh, with all the complexity that's going through the conveyor belt here, the other layer of complex, uh, complexity is these have a deep quality and these states can get stacked up one on top of each other. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of gates, there's a lot of hidden states, which translates into a ton of linear algebra. And in the case of, of natural language processing, there's graphs. There, there's graphs that define um, uh, the, the universe of words that we want to be passing through and getting out of this model. Uh, this is just another visualization of layers. Um, the purpose of this is to give you a little bit of context about some of the hyperparameters um, that go into defining these architectures. Um, there's a size of what you want to recur. There's the number of layers. There's different types of models. Um, the way the, the GPUs and the training happens, they, they break up the mathematics into chunks, so they're not processing everything at once. That's our batch size. Um, th there's a lot of uh, pieces that go into defining this, and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but what I'd like you to take away from this is it's a fairly complicated endeavor. Okay, so let's shift gears here a little bit and let's look at a real world example. Um, and I was inspired by this from things that uh, I found online. But the task here is to take questions from Quora and to classify them. We're going to classify them as sincere with a zero or not sincere with a one. Okay? Um, and we're going to pass all of these into our um, LSTM. So first step is we're going to set up our libraries and define some parameters. Um, we're going to work with Keras. Uh, has, have you guys worked with Keras? Okay. Yeah, you know. So basically, it's a, it's a cleaner way to get to TensorFlow. Um, we'll use the tidyverse and data table. Um, we're going to set some parameters that feed up into the model. You guys should be familiar with most of that. Uh, Next, we're going to create tokens. We're going to pull in some training data and some testing data. Um, we're going to create tokens, which is really the converting the text to sequence of integers. And ultimately, we're going to pad those with LSTMs. It likes to have its text of equal length throughout, so we'll zero pad those. And I briefly toyed with the idea of doing this in real time with you guys, but on a pretty beefy desktop, it took a few hours to train. So you'll forgive me if we're sticking to PowerPoints here. Um, splitting the data, this should look fairly familiar. There's labels, there's um, training, test, and validation. And you can see the splits down here. Embeddings. So a big part of natural language processing is a corpus. And that's our universe of words we know. Um, there's a number of those that are publicly available. Some are from Wikipedia News. Some are from Google. Um, there's lots and lots of good options. Often what happens when people are doing these in an industry-focused way, they will use industry-specific corpuses. There are corpuses for law, for medical, etc. cetera. Um, but there's, we pull in our wiki corpus here. Um, we loop through the, the embeddings. Um, and ultimately, we're going to land these uh, in matrices and arrays. Um, and the thing to take away from this is they use dense vectors in this particular example. Um, if you think of corpuses of words, both on an x and y axis, what's going to happen if you have a million words? sparse. It's going to become very, very, very sparse. So one way to work around that is to use these dense matrices. Um, pardon me, dense vectors. A dense vector. 
Vector, yeah. Vector, yeah. I could show you an example at the end. But basically, it's one word with a bunch of um, continuous variables after it that say what other words that word of interest is associated with. Um, okay, so let's define what we want the architecture of our, L I'm sorry. Oh, it was um, Wikipedia News. It's about a, a million rows, I think. Um, they're available online. It, when I post this, there'll be links to all this. You can get it off of my GitHub. Did that answer your question? So let's define our model architecture. Um, we're going to have a Keras model, um, and we're going to define various layers within that. Um, so we drop in our word embeddings. Um, we are going to, I think I skipped a page, pardon me, I'm sorry. I'm just going to go back, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about some of the layers that are inside of this model. Uh, here um, we have our, our wiki word embedding, our corpus. Um, here we're defining that this is going to be an LSTM. Um, and some of the parameters that define the LSTM, uh, dropouts, which is basically saying amongst all the activations inside of the network, only, drop, only use 75% of those. Drop out 25%, and the benefit of that is without that feature, most of these models tend to overfit. Um, uh, here we're defining what we want our um, our dense layer to have is uh, reload units, and we're also going to have um, sigmoid for our gating and activations. This way. Uh, now we're pulling it all together to build the model. Um, uh, inputs and predictions, uh, embeddings, and then we're going to compile it. Uh, we're going to use Atom uh, for stochastic gradient descent. And essentially what that is doing is we start out the model, we'll randomize our weights, we, we have what we want the training label to be, we pass through all the different gates and, and do a lot of linear algebra and we come out with an answer. And we measure the error, the accuracy, what, what, between what we th it should be and what the model measured it to be. So now what we have to decide to do is we need to change the weights to get to a more accurate answer. But how do we know what direction to change the weights into? The way we do that is we do calculus back through the model, which is called um, stochastic gradient descent is one way to do it. Atom is another way to do it. But ultimately, when we do all that calculus, the answer that's going to pop out is change the direction to change your weights. Are the weights going to get smaller? Are they going to get bigger? Um, and then we go through and loop through the model again. Um, and the goal is to do this many, many times and to shrink the error. Yep. Where in the model do we define how many layers there are? Or is that really in here, some in these uh, embedding layers. Um, there's a default the LSTM layer. I believe by default has one or two layers inside of Keras. There's a default to that parameter. As you pick out that it's LSTM, you can explicitly define the quantity of layers, and it's just picking out the default. It's a good so question. Yes, exactly, exactly. So by default. It's a good point. There's three layers, input, output, and hidden. And the, the, the hyperparameter lets us define how many hidden layers we want. Um, I have to go back and look. I forget if the default is one or two. Okay. Um, so we've set up the model architecture. And there's a couple of things I'd like to highlight here. Um, number one. The total quantity of parameters inside of here is 4.6 million. 
the, the number that um, Keras found to be trainable is 101,000. These are just massive quantities of activations. So we as data scientists, it's a big challenge, I think, to get our heads wrapped around what these models are doing. So how do you explain that to a user? How do you explain that to a lawyer? So I think there's a ton of value to doing it, but, but to do it is not a trivial undertaking. And I believe that the advancement these methods have made is, is getting further away from the explainability. And, and there's value in this explainability, I believe. Yes, yes. Do you get the benefit of, uh, do you get the benefit of, uh, let's say, faster trading by, you know, ordering your inputs one way or another, or grouping it in one way or another, to reduce the training cycle? Um, I would imagine that if you chose to order, I haven't explicitly tried to do that, but I would surmise if you ordered your data by that um, dependent variable, you're going to pull the model around in really big directions. So if you're, if you're feeding in only sinceres, the weights are going to get themselves comfortable with sincere. And then when you hit the next one that's unsincere, you're going to come up with a big error. And you're going to have some big walking of your variables to get back to your conceptually regressing to the mean. right? I haven't done it. It intuitively, intuitively doesn't feel right. Um, and ultimately, what's going to drive these things, um, the way people tend to do these things quicker is tuning your hyperparameters and leveraging things like GPUs. Um, that's where people typically uh, see the benefit in training this. It's a good question. Um, I would speculate it would add to the training time. And here we fit the model. Um, uh, it's going to come through 30 epochs. 30, an epoch is just a training cycle of going backwards and forwards in, in our propagation. Um, and at the end of the day, we're getting um, accuracy of 95%. This side over here. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, and here's a, a ggplot that tells us what's going on as we train the model. So on the top, our y-axis is loss. Our x-axis is the epoch, epoch, a training iteration, a full training iteration. Um, and it's a nice plot. You can see over time, as we do more and more training, the loss rates are coming down, and the accuracy is going up. Um, there's a little bit of a, a divergence here. and. Um, it would be interesting to look under the hood what's driving that. Um, but 95% is a pretty good accuracy. Um, I would want me to check to make sure that we're not overfitting. Um, it kind of sends up a flag that we might be doing that. Um, but the, the purpose of this exercise is to take you through the life cycle of training. <laughs> All right, um, let's try this. I spent way too much time trying to get this GIF in here. But I personally think this is a great metaphor. I think it's great because conceptually, the way we come at these deep learning models are we say, here's the answer. Here's a bunch of data. And here's a bunch of calculus and linear algebra and, and, and graphs of text and these examples in between. Like a child, learn. Learn where the signals are. Um, and you know, over t at first, it's not going to look pretty. You're going to have ugly losses. But over time, it should get better.
Mm-hmm. How does that turn into a classifier for the expand amount of bandwidth? Um, you can have all sorts of output layers and gates um, that will turn that into a classifier. So um, there's a probability. So if you go one layer back, you're going to have a probability. Um, and you can cut that off. Uh, you can have output classifiers attached to the LSTM. You can define what that output layer is. Um, uh, and it allude, the term eludes me at the moment. I'll think of it. Um, but you can define what you want that, all sorts of um, classifier type algorithms in that output layer that's ultimately going to give you a one and a zero. And behind it, there, there's, it's like a probit model. We might have a zero to one and some cutoff. Above that, it's a one. Below that, it's a zero. That's the concept. Um, I'll think of the term in a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. Explaining. You guys know what this is from? Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad. Very good. Um, all right, so the remainder of this uh, presentation is going to be focusing on LSTM bits. Um, it's this analysis system, it's very visual, and it has all sorts of very cool graphical um, uh, renderings of what's going on inside these LSTM networks. Um, and, and what to do with all these state, you remember the cell state that was going through there? Um, what is going on with those cell states. So um, this tool came out, I think, in 2016. Um, there's a white paper. Okay. There's a white paper associated with it. Um, the, there's a lot of information that we're going to unpack here. Um, and if I could get online, we'll actually go through and use it and touch the tool. Um, but the way I think about it is you have people that architect the networks, you have people that are going to train it, and ultimately you have users. This, in my mind, is predominantly a tool for the architects and for the data scientists that train their networks um, to tease out what patterns are significant, what activations are significant inside the network, and ultimately communicate that. Because, in my mind, a goal of a model is not necessarily the most accurate one. It's the ones that the people who use it embrace, the one that they choose to use it, that they feel ownership and a stake in it, and, and that the knowledge of their business that they bring to the table, they have a good sense of, of how this model is going to behave in those various scenarios. All right, let's unpack what's going on here. Um, yes. So first, um, let's think of an overly simplistic language, OK? The only purpose of this language is to count the number of open parentheses. Um, so what we're doing here is every time there's a left parenthesis, we're incrementing a counter by one. And every time there's a right parenthesis, um, we're going to decrement the counter by one. So I'm not a big fan of these overly simplistic examples. But there's a lot going on, so just bear with me for a minute here. Um, so what we're doing, what we're going to do, is we're going to take this language, we're going to pass it through an LST LSTM viz, um, and we want the model to predict the next sequence in this language. Is it a parenthesis, open parenthesis, a closed parenthesis, or a number? So there are two main parts of this tool. Um, uh, on the top is all about selections, and on the bottom is about matching the data that we've selected. All right, let's go through it one by one. Oops, I think I reordered these. Pardon me. All right, let's go this way. So I'm going to go back and forth, but there's a couple of, I could do it on the screen. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, what is this graph up top? Uh, our x-axis is the sequence of input words that we fed into LSTM viz. So it's, it's our parentheses language. The y-axis, um, all these lines, are the hidden states, those blocks that make up the sequence, if it's an RNN, or the blocks that contain our various um, forget 
input output, it's the activation associated with that. And it's telling us that what is activating inside of the network. So one observation you can take from this is you see when the parentheses hit, the activations spike up. So that's telling us that these transitions between parentheses are causing the hidden states inside of the networks to activate more. Um, and the way we got here is we selected this blue bar. Is this moving up? Yeah, okay. So this was, we brushed over this, causing this two parentheses to be highlighted. Um, and what that did was it said, well, there's one path through the hidden state where at this sequence, the activations exceeded our threshold. And that's what this red line is here. So we can connect the sequence to activations and what's firing and what hidden states are relevant. Um, and what we also get is this matching component down here. Uh, so we selected two parentheses, and here the tool is showing us inside of our inputs whether the ranges are similar to what we selected. And I'll show you in the tool, but the cool thing here is it can create all sorts of heat maps that are interactive and say amongst these similar parts of the, impact, uh, of the inputs, what other match counts are relevant? Okay. Let me pause here, because this is an important part before we go into some of the others. Is, do you guys have any questions about this? Pardon? Oh, you bet, you bet. So on the bottom, the question is on the lower right, this, this heat map, what is this? Um, Step number one, we selected the input that was of interest. Step number two, the tool came back to us and said, here are parts of your input that are similar to what you selected. So we selected two parent open parentheses, and you can see down here, here's two, 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 two parentheses, two parentheses. These are other inputs in the sequence that are similar to what we selected. And then It'll become clear in the input, but then as you mouse over this in the heat map, it's going to connect these high match counts back to the other sequences. So it's, it's a way of scanning what is matching here to the alternate sequence that the tool came back to us. It'll be a little clearer when I show you interactively. Um, I'm going to step out of the parentheses language for a minute because I want to highlight another feature and then we'll go into some real world examples. Um, so the input here is from a children's book. We can see that input here along the blue line on the bottom. And these are four different examples of the same sequence. And they're all telling us something slightly different. And, and I'll walk us through that. So what we brushed over was a little print. And that a little prince said, these are all the activations inside of your network that are relevant, the ones that are highlighted in blue. But there's something curious about this. Um, what is curious about this is that um, some of the activations are completely above the line, and some of them are below the line. And at times, what's really important to us is the transitions. What was, not, what was previously not important, but now due to this word change, what became important. So if we look over here, what we've done is we've extended this brush stroke over here to the left a little bit. And in doing so, these lines up on the top shifted from blue to gray. And now we can focus on just those elements that activated in this transition over here. So, we, so it, it's a way of connecting the inputs to the various activations and the patterns in the activations. Um, and similarly, 
we extended the, this line over here on the right, and we're, we're filtering down to those hidden states that are making the difference for this network, the network trans, oh, pardon me, um, in a little print. Um, I think, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, so, let me do this. Let me shift gears and go to the actual tool. I think that might be a little more compelling. So we're going to go to the live server, and there's the parentheses model. So there's roughly a dozen or so models um, that are live and up and running. These are all trained, and they're all plugged directly into LSTM Viz. Um, so I'm going to pick one of these, and oops. This one, PCA, that was the answer. So with this, oh, I'll come back to that. Um, all right, here's a real world example. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is just take a look at our sequence of, of words from the children's book that were fed into this model. And I'm gonna randomly pick some of these. Let's say, been glad enough, okay? And immediately, that took our universe of, of probably thousands of different hidden states and distilled it down to four. Um, and we can see those enumerated over here. Um, and then, so this is, this is sort of the selection of what we want to focus on. And now what we're going to do is let's take a look to see what matches here. All right. So, been glad enough. Um, what does the model consider to be similar to that? All right, um, been glad enough. Um, you may be, okay, was riding through. Um, and what we can do here is we can come at this either through the lexigraph of the text that was fed in, or we can go through it from the heat map to say, where are there many counts that are activating this network in different areas. Um, and we get that linkage between the heat map on the right um, and, and the language elements on the left. And there's other metrics that we can drop into this. Uh, this particular model includes parts of speech, which I'm going to add a meta track today. Parts of speech, except. So now what we're going to do is include in our graph the various parts of speech that were trained as part of this model. Um, nouns, pronouns, verbs. And I don't know about you guys, but I went into data science because I felt I wouldn't have to deal with this stuff. So, um, but we can come at it from a couple of ways. We can scan the heat map. Um, for verbs and punctuation, and we can connect that to other parts of the linguistics where the tool is telling us there's similar linguistics. Um, what, what the folks who built this did that I think is pretty cool prior to this, a lot of the analysis of these hidden states was in the form of heat maps. And heat maps are good and they have their place, but where they fall apart is they lose the time series quality that's inherent in these models. Um, and it starts to fall apart when these get massive. So, so the approach they took was to include the time series in the form of the linguistics on the x-axis, the hidden states that are relevant on the y-axis, and the heat maps down here. Um, the other thing you can do in this model is you can zoom. Let's see, where is it? Sorry. Position, pardon me. Come on. So we can shift around in our inputs a couple of ways. We can move to a numerical location, or we can search uh, for various terms. Um, not sure what else is in here. A kid's book. Um, play. 
Let's see if that comes up. There we go. And then we can jump to these various parts of the linguistics. Yes? So the question is, how is the taxonomy that we see on the bottom applied to other domains? Um, the way I'd like you to think about the bottom is that's our input. That's our x. So that's what's being fed into the model. Under the covers, there's a taxonomy. Um, and, and it comes in two ways. Number one, you're going to take from your inputs the unique set of words that the model is going to be trained to. And each one of those unique words will get a number placed up against that. Why? These models work with <coughs> linear algebra, right? Um, there is a taxonomy behind that. Um, that's not really bubbling out. Um, you could go into, we could go into the code. This code's up on GitHub, and we could see that. But the way to think about the bottom is, is our x and our series of inputs. Did that answer your question? Um, no, no, no. Um, it's less about the training process. And this LSTM, think of LSTM viz as picking up after training's complete. It's not describing for us the journey of training. We're at the destination. The model's been trained. What is going on within all these millions of activations and hidden states? Um, and, and ultimately, I, I think what this is doing, in my humble opinion, of doing a really good job of stepping down the path of, of shining a light onto what these hidden states are doing, making the connections across various parts of the input stream of words that are similar. And do similar words produce similar outputs, or are they producing something vastly different? I'm sorry. Is the similarity based on like the distinct distance between the words based on like the hidden state outputs? Yeah, there's a there's um, a distance metric inside of LTM viz that's saying these phrases are similar. Um, sorry, I must have missed this, but what's the model trained to do? Like what's it predicting? So it's at each state it's gonna predict what the next word is okay. in the path. So ideally, what this model would do, where it says child could, you'd want the model to say play. Um, so we, these are, whether it's words or stock prices or pixels, these models are going to predict the next step. And I didn't cover that, so thank you. Correct. That's right. That's exactly right. So the question is, what's the y-axis? Um, it, it's the value of the activations. What what is activating and what's not? Good question. So the question is, is this the PCA at the output layer, or is it something in between? And the way that gets decided is um, you can pick. So you can pick. The tool gives you the ability to interrogate the layer of your choice.
Exactly. exactly. If I could paraphrase what you say is, said is that you might think of this architecture differently between continuous data and um, language data. Um, and, and this particular tool is shining a light on the language part. And, and a lot of the um, parts of the model that are necessary to, to deal with the language elegantly. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, perhaps in slightly more detail, if you think about prior to the embedding layer to representing each word as one hot encoding, right? Yep. Now, in another type of input other than words, you would have multi hot encoding. So you have multiple events, in other words, multiple channels of information as part of the sequence model. For example, if you're listening to audio, you might be listening to yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. So in that case, the problem then is these types of visualizations, and I appreciate it's difficult enough, even with this relatively simple yeah. information, but when you're talking about multiple channels of information, then it's much more yeah. complex to, to That's right. And, and, you know, ultimately visualize. That's Simply right. because your input layer is, is assumed in this case to be a single encoded channel. That's right. That's right, and it's a good point because there's so many different architectures and you look at all these papers and they all come up with their own flavor of the architecture. So um, there's by no means a one size fits all. Uh, but the, the issue I think goes across all of these different types of architectures, different flavors of what you're predicting for. Um, the question I think is where does this type of visualization and the explainability really drive a lot of value? And at least from what I've seen, um, the places where it drives a ton of, of value is often connected to linguistics. Um, and one of the ideas I had to do with this is I was, I was going through in preparing this and um, one of my pet peeves is, is those parentheses examples that are kind of rudimentary and really don't carry real world significance. Um, so one of my aspirations in preparing this, and it, it always takes more time than I thought, was to take a bunch of 10K statements from, from businesses and take a series of 10Ks from the same company and train a series of LSTMs same company, different quarter, new LSTM, and then somehow use this to get a sense of how did 10Ks vary over time? Are, are, is uh, Apple changing a phrase quarter, in a particular quarter, and is there a signal there that's of meaning? Um, that was one idea. I don't know, maybe at the next talk. Good question. So two broad ways you can think about these models is each input is a word that gets encoded. So play is 0001, child is 0002. Um, another way you can choose to architect these models is on a character basis. So H is 0001, E is 0010, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just an architecture decision of how do you want to set up your model? In this particular example, the model, the model is architected around words. So each word will get encoded into a unique number. Um, so it's one of the architecture decisions that you're going to go through as you set up these models. Yes, 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 yes. And that you have that encoding on the inputs and the outputs to get you out of the text world and into the linear algebra world. Now I know I'm standing between you and the bar.
Yeah, so typically what, so the question is, um, before you do the training, do you adjust for spelling and things like that? Um, depends on your case. You know, if, you, if you're training in the real world about how people, I don't know, tweet or respond on Quora, or you might say people actually, the real world has spelling errors. So you may choose to include that. You may choose not to. That's a design decision. But more importantly, what you're going to do is you're going to standardize your data. And, and, and you might say run, runs, running all come down to the same stem word. And, and there's a standardizing step um, in encoding that. So the other one is more of a practical question. If I went to just use a regular relational database or some other type of relational database, load all the data, and then I'm going to do the prediction for the next word after three or four, where would I have uh, more compact resource requirements? For the database or to train one of these that you actually have it deployed? Oh, so is the question what's kind of be more resource intensive, your database server or the training of this? They're different. Sure, 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 sure. So um, I'll qualify it. I won't quantify it. Um, but your your database servers tend to be I/O bound, and. Totally. Right to totally. Yep. So yep. I'll tell you your main bottleneck in performance for these is CPU. These are really, really, really CPU intensive. If you heard my server, it's just a big, beefy desktop. Um, it, it was chugging away in the CPU for hours, training that, that l little test sample. And the way people address that is they use GPUs. And the GPUs, um, they're awesome. You can get an NVIDIA card for a few hundred dollars that has three 6,000 cores on it. And, and the good thing about all of this linear algebra, it, it breaks down into operations that can be parallelized very elegantly. So what you'll do to speed up these processes is you'll use TensorFlow with the GPU libraries. Um, and that will enable you to put that onto a GPU and do all of your training on the GPU. And then you want to size the amount of memory you have on the GPU. Um, they can have two, four, six, eight gigs. Ideally, you want to get a good chunk of your data to sit on that GPU so you don't have to swap out in and out of the GPU frequently. Um, and that's where you get into tuning your batch sizes. So one of the hyperparameters is batch size. How much do you feed onto the GPU at a time? Um, that's really where you get your bang for the buck. Um, and by the way, uh, getting all this to work with the GPU, I mean, I I've lost weekends that I will never, ever, ever get back trying to get all that to work. Um, it's not fun. It, it's extraordinarily sensitive to what version of which package and which library you're using. Um, and, and I have a big, beefy server. Everything's good there. I tried to set it up on my desktop too. Um, I got it to work. I had the things going in and out of the NVIDIA card, and I rebooted, and my screen went totally black. It just walked all over the graphics drivers, and uh, I'm deciding if I'm going to fix that myself or, or pay someone to fix it. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I think that's most of what I have. Um, there's a lot of varieties. Uh, there's GRUs, there's bidirectional LSTMs. Ah. That's a good, so there's one other one I'm aware of. Um, there's a seek to seek visualizer. 
Um, there's a paper about it. I've glanced at the paper. I haven't touched the tool. I can't speak to the quality of it. I know it exists. Um, but I'll tell you what I do want to do. I think um, this is a super powerful and exciting tool for the data scientist. Um, but my goal is to have the folks that use the models embrace them. And, and one of the domains I, I operate in is in the law, the legal world. And that's a huge challenge. It is, you know, what the lawyers will tell you is an entire case can hinge on one word. And they're looking for smoking guns, and it's their reputation. And that sensitivity to accuracy and word choice is a big deal to them. So one of the things that I would like to see out of this and I've been tinkering with um, is I'd like to scan all the inputs and I'd like to take the phrases that are most common and I'd like to wrap that up into a simple and elegant user interface and be able to pass just those phrases through and show the user what outputs those phrases create. And I'd like to have the user have the ability to enter in the phrases that they think are important and see what the model outputs from the phrases the user thinks is important. And I think that interactive testing in a really user-friendly mode um, would go a long way to stress testing the model, to gaining either finding weaknesses in the model or gaining confidence from the user community in the model. So I think this is an important step for the data scientist to narrow down areas that should be interrogated. But ultimately, I think the ownership of that interrogation should be with the users. And I think it's our job to enable that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's really smart. Um, and have you been following what Stanford has done recently? Um, they just rebranded their whole CompSci AI group as human artificial intelligence, which I think is really smart. And I think they're going for a lot of what you're talking about is the complement of what humans can do and, and, and what machines, the, the breadth and speed of what machines can do in ways that generalize well, and knowing that not all things generalize well. Right now, the machines do extraordinarily well at some relatively limited things. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. There's a great use case about that. Um, one of the things I did on this journey is I, I kind of audited a handful of Stanford classes. It's a, it's a cool thing to do, because A, the professors are rock stars. Um, B, they'll take a really interesting topic and they'll mix it up between the math, the intuition, and they'll intersperse, here's what the latest research papers tell you. It's just a very compelling way to go through a class. Um, but Andre Kaparthi, who wrote that great blog post, um, for a while taught a class on convolutional neural networks. Since then, he went to work at Tesla and is on top of their autonomous driving group. Um, there's a great YouTube where Tesla opens up their, their automated uh, driving group for a day and they showcase it to the media. And, and the way they talk about it I thought was interesting. Number one, um, they, um, it's not, they frame it as not a big data problem because there's so many outlier cases of getting a car to drive itself. What do you do in a parking lot? What do you do when it's snowing? What do you do when you can't see the lines? Um, so what they've done, which is crazy clever, they've got this fleet of half a million cars on the road. 
and they'll come up with a scenario that the model's not trained for. The model's trained to deal with cars. It's trained to deal with bicycles. But what does it do when the car has bicycles on it? And you can dream up these things all day. So what they've done is they have a second computer on the car, and they instruct the fleet of cars to say, if you see a picture that looks like this, send it back to us. And now they have targeted data to enhance their models in very targeted and specific manner. So it's not big data, it's the right pockets of data. And, and I think for that reason, I think they're going to, I wouldn't venture a guess of when, but I, I think they'll crack the, the, the code sooner than many think. Okay, so, um, last question and we're going to wrap up. Oh, gosh. Um, that's not a short question. <laughs> um, but this relates to something you spoke about before, where you have a sentence, where you have like baseball for TM with the sentence, and you have clean sort of stuff. Yep, yep, is yep. There, connection? there is in the LSTM, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'm not trying to duck your question. I'll answer it in depth more. But the long pole in the tent is generally getting your data right and getting your data clean and getting it to run through as expected. Um, the architecture questions are important, um, but I'm going to save that for after the lecture to talk about. So thank you guys. Um, I've been excited about this. And uh, hand it back to Jared. Thank you, so thank you very much. There's a few quick things before we head out.